Hi, I'm Dana Frank. I'm a professor of history at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, I write about uh, U.S. history and Central American history, usually focusing on labor, social movements, women, um, activism. Great. And also, sometimes I do research on local history. I grew up in Mountain View, and it's, I've been poking around recently in local history as well. I wrote a book about the labor movement in Seattle and the use of consumer tactics in the labor movement in the 1920s. Uh, I wrote a book about the history of campaigns to promote American products and the strengths and weaknesses of that. Uh, I wrote a book about a sit-down strike by a hundred young white women um, in 1937 when these young women occupied a Woolworth store in Detroit for a week and won all their demands. Um, I wrote a book about women's projects in the banana unions in Latin America in the last 20 years. And most recently, I wrote a book about um, called Local Girl Makes History, um, in which I went back to four local semi kitsch monuments, uh, all about an hour from West Valley, <laughs> all in this area, and investigated the politics of their history and my own relationship to them. Well, I'm trained as a professional historian, so um, uh, so that means that on a lot of things, one thing it means that I usually get a lot of time to do my research. So unlike a journalist, I can sometimes spend um, a whole year or two, sometimes even three or four years, not full time, but many, a long time putting into the research. So that's one thing. Another thing is because I'm a historian and especially as a professional historian, I spend a lot of time in archives more than other people do. So that's a big part of what I do. Um, and you know, sometimes you have a period, you're writing on a period where everybody's dead and sometimes I write on the more recent period and people are still alive. So I also do interviews. Um, because some of my research is on the more recent period, I also do poking around in uh, people's, the people have private collections where they saved some documents. So usually I'm, I both use documents and um, visual materials and I also um, do interviews. One of the things I work on is the labor movement. So I'm looking for collections of correspondence, uh, letters that people wrote. Um, I use minutes from meetings. That's always exciting if somebody took minutes, and especially if they typed them up. That's always nice handwritten stuff. So I, I read a lot of letters. I read um, recently. I've been reading a lot of government documents, embassy reports, um, things that State Department produced. Um, uh, so memos reporting on something. Um, you know, and then. Um, sometimes you can find pamphlets in archives. Um, I use a lot of old newspapers, um, and sometimes you get the originals of that, and sometimes they're on microfilm. Now, the world has changed. I was just thinking about this. It used to take a lot of work to find where were the records of the such and such organization, and now you can just Google it. You just say the name of the organization, and or the person, papers of so and so, and you can and Google it, and it'll pop up, and it'll say, oh, it's at Cornell University, or it's at Stanford, and then you then you go into the website for that place, and they'll tell you what's in that collection. This is interesting. How do I record things? Because when I wrote my dissertation, which is now a long time ago, maybe I don't know, twenty. 25 years ago. I did the whole thing on note cards. I did four by six note cards and I had 12,000 of them it turns out in the end. So I, I kept, I, did, I broke every little piece of information. I wrote it down in my own handwriting. I coded where it came from and um, I put it on a note card and I had shoe boxes upon shoe boxes and then I reorganized them by subject so I'd know exactly what I knew on every subject which was great. And then I reconstituted all that information by what, by by content. Um, now, by, that takes a huge amount of time, and I don't, that was when I had a year to sit down and take notes, and I don't have that kind of time or the money to do that. So now what I do is I usually go into an archive or to wherever the documents are going to be, if it's about documents, and I, I Xerox everything I can. Now, the, how I find the things within an archive is another story, but let's just say I've got a folder of papers that are useful. I'll go through that folder. Sometimes I just photocopy the whole folder, and sometimes I'll just take the documents that are useful and have those copied or copy them themselves. And so then now everything, I just as quickly as I can Xerox everything in sight that may or may not be useful. And then I take those home, and then I get overwhelmed by the pile of Xeroxes, which is the stage I'm in right now. And um, I'll go through and sort those Xeroxes, not by where they came from, but um, by the time period or the topic or the type of document. And then I read through them and find things that are in there that are useful to me or look for patterns. 
I highlight them on in different ways. I might just, right now, if you just see something, if I see something interesting, sometimes I do it in pencil and sometimes I do it in, you know, highlight colors. And I'll just say, use for blah, blah, blah. And you know, then I might take notes if I'm really working. Right now I'm just sort of glancing. I'll just mark it on the document. But I will also have a place I'm taking notes for more on A, take, you know, see this. Um, and, um, and then I'll write notes to myself on the document. Um, and later I'll use, but I have to be careful not to mark them up too much because later I might highlight in green a quote that I'm going to use and I want to be able to be able to find that green site that it's the quote I'm going to use. Um, you know, something I would certainly pass on to students about the research process is you often think you're going to look for subject A, you're, you know, the, this topic, and you go in the archive and you think, or where, or whatever it is, if you, whatever source you're using and you, you're looking for anything on A and you know that A is connected to B. And you keep taking notes on A or photocopying the things on A and B because you're being flexible. And, and then when you get it done, you realize, I realized this the hard way in my first book, that it really, I kept seeing C and thinking, ah, oh, C. And only later did I realize that C was the key to A. And in fact, there was a lot on C, more than on A. And now what I do is when i doing research is I not only do I uh, always want to keep track of what did you already look at. Because you can forget whether you took notes on a certain book or a certain um, set of documents. Now I not only do the research harvesting, if you want to say that, whatever I'm going to think is useful, but I will also have to keep notes to myself as for more on, on whatever topic that I'm seeing that I'm not taking notes on or photocopying, come back to this. There's a lot of interesting stuff because there's sort of an intriguing story here that would be kind of, that's sort of tugging at you for a reason that might actually be what you want to write on next or bring back or come back to look at. It's kind of detective work and that's why it's fun. I mean, I love being a historian because it's just giant detective work. And, um, you know, you, it's always sort of triage too. You know, you have to always um, looking for where you're going to get the highest yield and not you know, not keep barking up a tree that's not going to deliver anything for you. One of the biggest things that um, historians use is other people's footnotes. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. In fact, um, I think students already know to get secondary sources, the best way to get the secondary sources is to find the most recent article book or book on your topic, and they will have some kind of a footnote in the introduction. If it's an article, it'll be about the third footnote, sometimes the first one. If it's in the book, it'll be some kind of series of footnotes to the introduction of the book. Well, they'll say, well, for previous works have been, you know, by Bob and Susie, Susie and, and, uh, and all these other people, and they will list all that. Well, they will also give their sources. So I'll look at what somebody else is, has looked at. In fact, I just did this. Um, I'm interested in some stuff that the AFL CIO did in Honduras in the 1950s and 60s and I have an article that someone else wrote about Chile in that period and she I'm looking to see well does she have any sources there that I don't know about and it, that's not stealing you're just you, you, know, you wouldn't take it directly from her and I'm writing on a different topic but I'd say what kinds of things was she, was she able to look at and that's a classic way is to just the previous people that have worked on the closest you can get what kinds of sources did they look at um, and that will usually trigger some things. Um, talking to librarians is always great. You know, I'm a big fan of librarians. You know, they are your friend, and they love interesting questions. They're really bored with images of X in Time magazine. They love hard research questions, and this is they live for this. And also, if if you, of course, I always tell my students, if you talk to a reference librarian and you don't get along with them, or you you went off and cried because you couldn't figure out what they wanted you to do. Just come back an hour later and there'll be a different one at the counter and you can ask them the same question all over again and, and you can do it all day. And then of course you want to find one that you know and then you can find out when they're at the desk and ask them. So you want to have your personal friend, the reference librarian. And it's also, one thing I see students do is I'll say, go look at this and this and this, I'll say. And I'm reference librarians do it too. And the students um, will, I'll say that in my office hours and then Two weeks later, it turns out they did the first thing and they hit some kind of a wall. Like they couldn't figure out how to get into the find, into the, the website for this. Or they couldn't figure out, like, did they have to call that person to find out? And they hit that wall and they get paralyzed. So one thing you is you have to sort of be intrepid. And it's fun, but you do have to keep hitting against those walls. And for you have to not be afraid to call people. I mean, we haven't talked about this, but I do do a lot of interviews. and. 
you have to not be afraid to call strangers. You know, they're nice. They like it when you ask, want to interview them because it makes them feel important and like what they do in the world is useful. And they're usually kind, nice people. And some of us have language issues. You know, some of us are English as a second language. And you think, oh, your English isn't good enough. And this is a big issue for me because I do interviews in Spanish. In, in Central America, and I always think, oh, the most terrifying thing in the world is calling a stranger up in Spanish. But people are always nice, and you can always ask them to <laughs> repeat what they said. And, um, and, and, and also, they don't mind that you're nervous and have never done an interview before, because the minute they start talking, they just, it's, they, people just love to talk about themselves and what they did and be experts. So don't be afraid of that kind of research either. Two tips I would say, I always say, look at the footnotes to uh, recently publish something. And the other one is, the other thing is talk to somebody who knows a lot about the subject. And you can, you can that's the most efficient way. You know, just call some, your friend's father worked in that industry, or you know, your old neighbor, or somebody you know, any kind of connection that anybody will suggest, um, talk to them and they'll, they'll know more and they will, give you all kinds of tips on how to find out about that thing. Part of it is just the assertiveness about poking around because once you start poking around, I mean, research is really fun and we haven't talked about that, but I've talked about it as detective work, but it's really thrilling when you find something. When you do primary research with documents um, the way historians do, it's so fun when you discover something that nobody had written about or nobody knew or just some interesting twist to your story that you know it's going to make a good story. And it's like that, aha, wow, look at that. And you might be sitting there reading the newspaper for three hours, really bored and you know, waiting for lunchtime. And then suddenly you find this story about something that's like totally amazing both to you and to other people and changes the whole way we understand the story. Yeah, and you know, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. That can be secondary sources. And sometimes you just put some pieces together. You saw something here and you saw something here and you saw something there and suddenly you realize I like in the, some of the research I'm doing and in, which involves the CIA and I'm not involved with the CIA the research is partly about CIA activities is suddenly you by triangulating these pieces of information you realize this thing was funded by the CIA and you had to have and suddenly it like whoa or sometimes you just find a document in which somebody says something really bald or sometimes um, you know it can be in visual materials and I've really, over the course of my um, research and writing career, learned to use visual materials more and more. I think when I was first starting out, I really saw print sources, documents, newspapers, things like that. And then I gradually really realized um, uh, how to use, not necessarily how to use, but that visual materials are extremely important. One of the things I've really changed in the course of my um, researching for my over the course of my research life is to lose visual materials more and more and I used to just use printed stuff or handwritten stuff letters and writing and and I, I just I think I just didn't get it and um, the t thing that really changed was I was writing about a sit-down strike at Woolworths in 1937 and um, I wanted every single thing I could find out about what was going on inside that store, and I could never find any of the original strikers. And I worked very hard on everything I could find, and it was sort of this challenge because I wanted to make a great story. And then I realized I found these like ten photographs that were taken inside the store, and I spent hours looking at those photographs and looking at things and details like that there were pieces of paper put over the counter so that they wouldn't hurt any of the goods inside the store, um, and then. And there was one a newsreel that was made by a newsreel before there was television. There used to be these newsreels that would show uh, in movie theaters before the feature movie, and they would be about the news. And um, and there was a newsreel about the strike, and in it, it some of the scenes were staged, but they had these young women, you know, going to bed at night on their you know on their blankets on the floor and between the goods in the middle of the store. And, um, and there was the one scene, I watched it over and over again, and suddenly about the tenth time I watched it, it was very blurry, I realized that one, one of the girls reached over and tickled the back of the girl next to her right as they were lying there, you know? And it was just sort of like that little tickle, it was like, look, I hadn't even seen that. And that's sort of something that was never in any written source, right? And also, I noticed when I looked at the... Um, Pictures, if you look at the pictures of them the first day, they, they were in this plant, in this store, occupying it for a week. 
and, and won all their demands. And in the first days, they have like sort of ordinary hairdos. And if you look at them the last day, they have beautifully, every curl is perfect, and they have all this makeup on. And they've clearly spent a lot of time doing each other's hair while sitting around in this store with not a lot else to do, right? And so I knew that entirely from the visual evidence. Um, and that's been really fun to learn to do that. Well, you know, in my experience, the research, finding the stuff is really fun because that's your detective work. I mean, it's a little frustrating when you don't find it. But once you find it, you know, it's fun, you know, and you're, you, you have the sense of discovery. It's a little tedious doing the photocopying or taking notes, but it's fun. And then you have to make this transition to writing about it. And there's this middle stage, which is called processing your findings, or you can call it whatever you want. That's what I would just call it. And that's when you sort of look at what you have and see what's in there. And I can say that no matter how much you have or how little how much you have, it feels overwhelming because the world is always more complicated than we can write about it. And any, any topic and anything you research is always going to turn out to be overwhelming because life, we're the world is very, very complicated. And so some of it is looking at, I spend a fair amount of time just looking, reading through what I have really fast, just skimmy, to get a feel for the big patterns and to get a feel for what Pat, what am I going to want to write about? And then I, sometimes you just have to take notes on some, some sort of technical things, like if I'm writing on a strike, what happened what day, right? Or what do, all the, what do the acronyms stand for? Or the stuff I'm doing now, like, well, who was ambassador to Honduras which year? And you just kind of, and you have to figure that out from the dates on the letters. So some of it is just processing material in there, but you can get overwhelmed by that. You know, sometimes um, I look at the material and figure out, well, what kind of thing do I want to argue? And when I'm really overwhelmed, I'll just stop and say, what do I want to argue? And then which materials in here are going to be best to prove my argument, to support my argument? And so which ones are, and I'm also, as a historian, you're always looking for flashpoints because you can't talk about everything. So you're looking for a story or a flashpoint um, that um, is going to cap capture all the larger contradictions and dynamics that you want to discuss in your argument. So that's always what I'm looking for. And so if I have like a pile this high and of all these different events, and this one is the one that captures it, I, I'll look at these to get a feel for the big pack pattern, but I'll focus on this one because I, and also that's a storytelling thing. I know that that's going to make a better story. And so I also now look through this and I'll say, okay, what's a great story? For example, there's a hurricane that hits Honduras that a lot of things happen after it. And in 1973 or so, and it's called Fifi. And it's, I think it's amusing that it's called Fifi. And it's because the idea of this little French portal attacking Central America is really amusing, right? It made you laugh. And it actually turns out they call it Fifi which is even better, right? So I'm going to write about Fifi just because it's fun, but it also, there's all these repercussions from this hurricane, but I also know I got a good story because it's dramatic and it fleshes out lots of other dynamics and it's funny that it's this French poodle hurricane after, named after a French poodle name. And so I'll go through and I also go through and I look for a really juicy quote, like just a quote that, um, that captures the essence of the whole story. That, or a, a particular thing that I realized. But of course, you have to figure out what you want to say before you figure out what's the best material to say it. One of the things I'm looking for is anything that not only that captures the core dynamics I want to write about or proves my point in a very clear way, but also anything that makes me laugh, any, you know, like Fifi, uh, anything that um, puzzles me that sort of seems to pull, that would pull the reader in. If I've got a mystery that I'm going to solve that you want to be thinking about, I, I want to think about what's going to be useful for the reader. Because writing is not just I think great thoughts inside my head and write them down. Writing is really about um, making it clear for the reader, but also for me, the kind of nonfiction writing I do, I want somebody to read it before they go to bed and not fall asleep, right? Bottom line, they have to turn the page. So I'm looking for material that's going to make them want to turn the page and also that's going to explain the world or whatever little piece of it I'm trying to explain. I was writing a book about the history of campaigns to promote American products. And in the 1970s and 80s, there were all these campaigns that attacking Japan for undermining the U.S. economy and saying we should all be just to buying American products. And there were, in the 1980s, there were these television ads. And I always wanted to know who was behind these ads. And, um, and also, there are all these Walmart campaigns that saying you should buy American products. Okay, so 
I found out who was behind those campaigns, and it turns out they had also sponsored the Miss America pageant, right? And it also turned out that this guy had funded some very right-wing political campaigns, Pat, Pat Buchanan, and had been, and also was a famous, famous union buster. So for me, this guy was just interesting, but also I could talk about the Miss America campaign, and I, then I also had these great stories of Miss America talking about buying American products, but I also got to talk about her, her love, a quote was about her, Miss America's lovely marimba number that she did during, the, during her, uh, her uh, tryout, or whatever it's called, the pageant, when she was com during the competition. And that's an example of uh, something that you can see a confluence of things come together, because you can see political forces behind these campaigns, Campaigns. You could see how it crossed over into popular culture, um, and also um, how it was related to union busting. And you could see all those things come together in one particular moment. But it also had some kind of entertainment factor to it. This is record keeping problems, right? Because it's always a problem if you've got, you know, a folder where you put everything that was about um, Walmart, let's just say. You put everything about Walmart is in that folder and then you, I pull out the document. I'll look at that and I think, what are the best things I have about Walmart, right? And I'll take notes on that. And then I have a few that I'm going to take quotes out of. I actually pull the document out of that folder and put it in the folder um, for the part, I'm, the chapter I'm writing about, or the subsection. It's really tricky because you have to put it back. And there's, a, you know, there's the what do you do later? Because you have to keep track of it for the footnote. The way I work is um, I, I work on a sort of subsection at a time, and I'm a really hardcore outliner. So I probably would pull, I would look through that pile and I'd pull various things that were the best stuff I have and then I would take a piece of paper and I'd write down, you know, quote from Sam Walton about this, um, campaign in 1982 saying bringing it home to the USA, um, caught, you know, whatever it is, I would have a list of the best stuff. And then I, um, I, I take that paragraph and then I choose, like maybe that's when they come two paragraphs, I choose which examples I'm going to use and then I put I, this is how I work, and I, I'm a very, I, I never write a word without having it all outlined, every ex example I'm going to use in every order. And then I might, if it's short, I'll just repeat the quote and where I got it on that piece of paper, because you always have to treat track of it for the footnote. Um, and if it's something a little more extensive, I take the photocopy and I put it in the pile under the piece of paper with the outline for that section, and I mean that, that paragraph, and um, staple it or to that, and so when I go to write, all I have to do is look at that list of the things to think, and there's the quotes right there. Okay, so I don't have to spend any time um, trying to find stuff. What examples I'm going to use? I, I separate that process from actually writing a sentence. So when I got to write a sentence, I don't have to think about what I want to say. I just have to like topic sentence. Here's my three examples, and they're right there in that pile. Okay, and so sometimes if I if I'm going to find the best material, I'll just sort of pull that document. Pretty, when I'm pretty close to the writing process though, because otherwise you're going to have documents all over the place and you have to figure out where to put them back. It's overwhelming. I mean, you do have a lot of um, document control and also you have to be really careful about the footnoting front. You, you know, I learned that one the hard way and um, you, um, and you have to be really careful. You can't say, so I remember seeing something out there because sometimes when you go back and you were sure you saw it there, it's not what you thought. And, um, I, uh, when you have a footnotes, and you know, my first book had 85 pages of tiny typeface footnotes. And so, if you can imagine 85 pa typeset pages, okay, you know, and this project I'm doing now has huge numbers of footnotes. And not everything I write has footnotes because sometimes I'm writing for a popular audience. The stuff I'm doing now is popular, but it's on more controversial things that I want to show that I, where I proved it. And also, I want someone else to be able to replicate my research. So that footnote is partly to say I didn't make this up and it's partly so that if you're coming along after me, like we said before, and you want to learn more about this, you can actually find that document. I think the big thing is I move much more quickly to um, how I might want to use something. So before I just wanted to learn everything that happened everything I could learn in this sort of giant cast the net, pull the net in. And now I see a, a crab in the net. I think, ah, oh, crab in the net, let's look at crabs. 
I, I can see that that crab is going to be a story. I want to tell the story of the crab. And I realize that you don't get net crabs in nets. You get them in traps, but you can get the metaphor. Um, and um, I, so I think I'm much more quick to think, ah, how I'm going to use that. Now, that's something that comes with experience, because if you actually haven't written a lot, you don't even know how to imagine how you would use something. And, and I think that's the biggest part. I think that, um, you know, I think I'm more able to say, okay, this is enough. And, and that's always a hard thing because no matter how much time you have, there's always more out there than you can take notes on. And that is really over, a hard thing to make. You're always making these triage decisions. Even if you have like a month in an archive, every day you have to make decisions about what are the best things I should be taking notes on. What, how is this going to be useful? And you, you can't spend time barking up trees that are not yielding anything. Now, sometimes you do that. When I wrote my first book and I had these minutes of a central labor council, minutes of thousands of unions, and a daily labor-owned newspaper for 10 years, okay? I had a huge amount and it was right in front of me. But when I wanted to turn it into a book, I realized like I knew very little about the Japanese workers in that story, and that those sources were harder to find. So I had to. You know, I found some minutes of some Japanese unions. I had to pay someone to um, translate them for me. I had to find every interview that was ever done with somebody in the Japanese American communities to, and the Japanese immigrant community. This was in the 1920s to see if they talked about the labor movement. I found so it was much more tiny bits here and there, but but it was a strategic thing that I wanted to balance out the point of view and not just have documents produced by the white workers. I wanted to have the documents produced by the Japanese workers and see their story. Let's just say you want to write about um, uh, um, Franklin Roosevelt. You, every time he wrote a document, every time he um, signed a memo, all of that stuff, we know what he did every single day he went in his terms of office. And we know when he was governor, and we know all about his family, and we have 50,000 biographies of him because, so, and this is what is known as great man history, history that is about, you know, now, if you just go down a notch, if you want Eleanor Roosevelt, it starts to get a lot harder. But the minute you start wanting to have the history of ordinary people, well, they don't spend all day writing documents for the most part. They're not collected. They, you know, they just get thrown out. Or maybe they're, you know, cleaning houses all day. They're not producing documents. They may not even be literate. They may not be literate and, you know, they don't write letters to the, you know, they don't write newspaper articles. So there's, and also the minute you want to write about women's history, it gets harder because women's history is less likely to be collected. Women are less likely to produce documents historically. When you start talking about people of color, African American history is just harder. History of Latinos, history of Native Americans, um, any history of people of color is harder to document because they're not president and they don't have the relations of power with, or the time to, to produce documents. So the more elite and powerful you are in the society at the time you're writing about, the more likely you are somebody like you is going to produce documents. So you can't just go for whatever the most is out there because if you have a commitment to some level of equality in your kind of research and you want to do the kind of history I do where all kinds of people's history is valued, you have to work harder at it because it's going to be harder to find the stuff on women. It's going to be harder to find the stuff on the immigrants. It's going to be harder to find the stuff on the people that don't speak English. And th but that's part of the fun because you're, you're helping create a more just version of history in which everybody's story is valued. One of the things you love and is that sense of discovery. I think people think that doing history research must be really boring. But anybody that actually does it, it's like this thrilling mystery detective work. And then suddenly you find something that changes changes things or you can imagine writing about and it's it's thrilling at a really basic level. Um, it's about discovery and um, the other thing about doing historical research with primary documents is there's something called the thrill of the document. And I remember the very first time I, was, I felt this, I was reading some letters that these two people had written back and forth in 1920. And they'd had, one of them was a big intellectual, and this, his wife was a big activist. And, and they had had a fight. And this was a letter she wrote to him the next day about, she said, I'm sorry, I still love you, but I need to have some space in, in 1920s language. I need to have some space, and I just need to sleep at my friend's house last night. And it was like, whoa, you could feel this person and their relationship across time. And you realize that also, even in looking at old newspapers, you can get this hit. But you realize that, oh, that history really happened. Uh, when you s read old newspapers, you can all get that very easily. But when you see a letter and you're holding it in your hand, and, um, and you, that letter was produced and it was written in someone's handwriting, 
um, you realize like there is this little shiver up your spine that I get even talking about it of that history really happened and you feel the passage that your connection to these human beings and something that happened and that's always a kick you know I call this having a historian attack I was in Charleston South Carolina with these friends and we went to where the slave market had been and I'm like the whole time, like, oh my God, I can feel the reality of slavery, which is hard to feel in California. Of course, we have to feel the genocide of the native people of California, and we have other stories that we sort of clean up and don't feel. But for me, being in South Carolina and seeing this, where a people, human beings were bought and sold, and suddenly you can like, oh, this is real, and this really happened. And when you're a history teacher and writer, you ha part of what you're doing is, trying to channel that for other people and feeling it. And um, it's a very powerful thing. When I'm doing interviews in, um, in Honduras, uh, people will say, if they, the cultural differences that I have to learn how to map. And my culture would say, call somebody up and um, make an appointment for Thursday. And I'll call someone up and say, hi, I'll be in Tegucigalpa on Thursday. Could we meet? And they'll say, oh, call me when you get there. And I'll call them when they get there, and they'll say, oh, I, I can't do it today. Call me tomorrow. And I'll call them tomorrow, and they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm going to San Pedro Sula, which is where I had just come from, right? And you could go on and multiply that times about 10 people, and it's just a different set system that I don't know how to map, and I didn't get my interview. You know, on the other hand, if I go to interview somebody, these are usually old men, you know, because that's how you get historical interviews. They, they give me lunch, they drive me to the next place, they get the cab for me, they're like the most gracious and wonderful people, welcoming me into their families, and that's something that's wonderful about, uh, you know, that I, about doing these interviews. So you never know what you're going to get, and you have to learn how to map what's going on with the person at the other end, you know, and um, what's useful for them. And the biggest thing is that you have to sort of always be willing to you know keep pushing at things and keep trying and have a and don't expect that you just get up in the morning and it's there you know you have to put a, a certain amount of time is just finding out what's out there finding out whether it's useful going through boxes and uh, like I said you have to also be constantly making calls about whether not literally calls but you have to constantly be making judgment calls about um, is this going to actually be useful is this should I keep trying to call this person um, and um, or should this just isn't going to be worth it? If it's the person who was at the center of the thing you're writing about, yes. If they're not, you're then going to call somebody else. Or is um, is this one of the things you do when you're an archive? And you know, I think probably students know this when they're writing papers, even with secondary sources. You know, you're going to get like six books at a library and seven, six or seven articles. The first thing you do is look to see which ones are most useful. You don't go one by one by one by one. You sort of skim them all just to see what, and you do the same thing when you're in an archive or doing research. You, it's pretty thrilling. They, are, they bring out a box, and the box has folders inside of it, and inside the folders are these original documents. And the first thing you do the first day, let's just say you have a week in an archive, which is a pretty common thing for me, and you call, you always call ahead of time and make sure the boxes are going to be available and they're going to be open that day because that stuff, you, you can get that stuff wrong. And sometimes you have to wait a day for the boxes, so you have to have them fetch them for when you're there because they're in, in the warehouse somewhere. And they bring you this box, and you, it's thrilling. You don't really know what's in there. You know that the guide said Folder 7 has materials on whatever it is you're looking for. The first thing you do is you look at all the boxes and see what does it look like inside them. You know, everything that you can, every, the, most boxes will let you look at. And then you can see, ah, here's a gold mine. And there's not, or you can see, well, this, or you can see, no, there's really, that didn't turn out to be useful at all. Or you can say, well, it, it's something in between. Like, if I have time, there might, there's some good stuff in here, but this is the box with the gold mine, and I'm going to do that first, and then you work your way through the other boxes. So it's just, and you're doing that all day. And yeah, absolutely. You, you, you want to be working for first with the things that are most useful, and then you work out into um, what, what you need to explain what you're finding, when you realize that, that, that this is, you can't understand this without that. You know, like I'm doing this research on, on the, the I, uh, suddenly I'm realizing that I need to know more background on the Alliance for Progress in Latin America, this U.S. Um, aid campaign that Kennedy 
uh, initiated that I, I need to have, I have to go read some secondary source about that because I really need to know how this program I'm looking at was part of the Alliance for Progress. And so I'll go back and forth. I tend to find the secondary stuff more useful once I get into the primary stuff because otherwise it's too boring. But then when I have something I'm seeing that I want to explain, then it's like, oh, this is great. This is exactly what I wanted to know. Before I would feel kind of dutiful, like, well, I really should read about the Alliance for Progress kind of thing, which is hard to do when you get up in the morning. I guess I want to sort of say there's this balance between um, the tedium and the exciting stuff. And you have to accept that, and a lot of it is about patience. You have to accept that you're not going to find everything immediately. You have to accept that some amount of what you're doing is just photocopying or taking notes or, you know, just plotting stuff, you know, figuring out what happened, what the dates, making a timeline for whatever you're writing about. And the balance between that and, like, the thrill of the discovery, the thrill of feeling the connection to historical time, the, the joy of telling a story well and thinking about your reader, um, landing a really, landing something that's funny, you know, you know, like uh, the Hurricane Fifi, you know, just knowing that you're giving pleasure to the reader through what you're doing and uh, is fun and but also just it's not there is a romantic side of it and there's also the extremely unromantic side of it being alone somewhere else you know in a strange place where you feel like you don't know what you're doing sometimes in a language you don't feel really comfortable in you know and um, and all of that or and, and also feeling like you ever don't really know what you're talking about and I can tell you that whatever you're researching is always forever and ever going to be more complicated than you can understand it so you have to make that leap of faith to say, but this I do understand, and this, this my evidence is telling me, and I can talk about that. When you're doing history research, there's always something in there that nobody knew about. And part of what you do is you're watching for things that nobody knew about that you could then share with the world and see how this has changed our understanding of the world. And that's, but even if you're not doing original primary research, you know, original research that's going to change the world at a professional level, you still, um, why, you still can look at primary sources or interview people and learn things that make you feel it and you understand it in a way that you can convey to somebody else. And that, that research process is always um, fun. I think well, the more daunting is the processing stage, and maybe because I happen to be in it right now, I'm feeling like, oh, no, I can't do this, because I love to write. So I'm always like itching to write. And then if I were writing, I'd be saying, oh, God, it's so oppressive to write, because writing is both thrilling and really scary and overwhelming, but uh, the research process itself of actually finding the stuff I think is really fun. Oh, well, actually, I'm like, uh, this is my speech because I'm the uh, most hardcore in outliner I've ever known, and I think it's why I can write fast and well, because I, I'll do the outline of, say, a chapter or an article, something like a 30-page unit, let's say. And that will take me a week, and it's like wrestling an alligator, right? And I'll figure out, and I can go in more detail about how I get there, but let's just say I get to the 30-page outline, and then I take a subsection, which is anywhere from five to eight pages, usually six to eight pages, and I'll work on nothing but that. And I'll take that, and I'll um, break it down paragraph by paragraph. Before I write a word, no, this is long before I'm writing a word, I break it down paragraph by paragraph, the paragraph order, and then I'll, uh, then I'll look at it, even before I do that, I'll say, well, about two pages on this and about three on this and one on this, so that I don't end up, you know, classic, we all follow this problem, that the background section, takes, you get paralyzed at the background section. But if you know that the background section is only going to be two paragraphs, then you just think, oh, well, that's easy. These are the key points I have to make, right? So I'll figure out how much space I want a lot within that. And within the big outline, I would do that. And then, then I'll, let's just say I have seven pages, and I'll make a list of the paragraphs level points. And then I'll go, par and there's usually the baby introduction and the baby conclusion, right? And um, that's pretty straightforward. And then I'll take each paragraph, and I'll say, here's the topic sentence, or here's the argument. And then I'll go, and this is where I would pull it from the documents. I would take um, all the best examples and material I have. It might be a quote, a statistic, a little story, um, and another quote. And say I have seven of those. I'll just write it down in a list on the piece of paper. And, um, and then I'll look and say, I'll stop and say, what are the best ones? I'll, and then I'll say, and I'll put them in order. Open this because it's basic, land this because it takes a little longer, and then the punch at the end with this one with that. And I'll put them in order. I'll go one, two, three, four. And the other three aren't going to make it into the paragraph, okay? And then I, and I put the, the Xerox of the 
quote or the or take notes on it, whatever it is, get the number for a statistic and I put that in a pile and then I do the next paragraph. And I'll do a whole subsection. It'll take me like three days, right? Two, three days. And then I have the whole pile for that paragraph and then I'll write eight pages in one day. Because all I'm doing is coming up with something roughly like a sentence about each of those things. And then I can, and I know exactly where I'm going, so it lets me have flow in the argument, right? Because I, it's not so flat, because I know where it's going and where it's going to land. And a lot of people don't like to slow down and do the outline, because I think when we hear about writing, you think, you always hear the people say, oh, I write two pages every day. Well, I, I've never worked that way. Um, because when would you spend the time outlining the big picture? And I think there's this cult of the actual writing the sentences as that's the writing process. And for me, my, I have a ratio of outlining to writing that's about four to one. So I spent a huge amount of time on the outlining. And then when I write, it just it's all ready to go. Because I don't have to think about what I'm going to say. I can just think about saying it in some rough form. And then I'll fix it later. Right? I don't write perfectly polished sentences. I write something that approximates a sentence on that. And then the next, then when it's that whole chapter is done, I'll rewrite every sentence until it's beautiful. But um, I don't spend a lot of time getting jammed up about what I'm going to say because I've already figured that out. But you have to validate the time you spend sorting out the information and choosing your examples. And I think nobody does that. And uh, another thing I would like to say, this is about writing, not research, Easy, but I can only do it about four hours a day. Five days in a row, and um, I can't. And I, I could never do it. For I mean, my, my brain turns to mush after four hours. I have to go take a nap, go swimming, run some errands, whatever it is. I get recover enough to do it the next day. And um, and also, I don't just get up in the morning and write. If you told me I was going to write something, I have to say, okay, next Monday I'm going to write. And it would take me all these days to become the person that had the wherewithal. I think uh, one. A uh, piece of advice I got that I can remember was actually a reference librarian when I was an undergraduate, and I said I was kind of stuck writing, mm -hmm. and she said, "Oh, that's probably because you don't know what you want to say," mm -hmm. and that's when I separated out what did I want to say versus saying it, and I think that was probably mm -hmm. the key to um, figuring out what I wanted to say and and doing it. If you're doing nonfiction writing that involves research, you actually have a huge amount of your work is actually controlling your information, right? And managing that. And there's no validation of that or even recognition of the existence of that work as part of the writing process, including the after part of keeping track of all that stuff for the footnotes accurately. It's a huge amount of work that I, you believe me, I would be in such a bad mood if I was doing something with footnotes. Now I can just say, oh, footnotes. But um, <laughs> get to that later, But because I'm not writing with this stuff. But you know, just all managing all the information and feeling good about yourself, because the, the cult of the writer with a capital W is all about the person that thinks great thoughts in their heads and they sit down and they look at the beautiful meadows and fields and the thoughts flow and from their inner soul. Well, there's some stuff that comes from my inner soul, but mostly I'm deciding that I'm going to use this example for that one and that this is the story I'm going to tell and I have to know how many people are in that room. I have to be have somebody saying there were four people in that room. I have to be able to convince you that there were four people in the room using evidence. And so a lot of what I'm doing before I write is managing the research evidence. Thank you.